Good. Th this is the f our first talk about basic scientific methodology. Um, I'm really interested in how we set about discovering things about the world. Now, one of the first things you have to do in order to discover things about the world is go out and describe what's there. You go out and you start looking around and you start noting what you can see. You do descriptions. Uh, for example, we might go out and look at a source text and describe what's there, a target text, describe what's there, and then list all the differences, the translation shifts, as you call them sometimes, between the two texts, and fill up a uh, hundred or two hundred very boring pages of description, which nobody would want to read, and could we be sure we've discovered something? There are several things wrong with just describing what is there, or just saying, I'm going to study a certain object. One of the things is you don't know what you've discovered. And the second thing is you didn't have a problem to solve. And I'd like to present uh, some very basic concepts about discovery procedures and problem solving. The one I want to talk about today is that of a model. It just says that when we discover the world, we don't see everything there, we don't grasp its full complexity, we don't even need to describe the, the, the complexity at the beginning. What we have to do is model what's there. For our own minds, for our own perception, we draw a simplified representation of what's there. And that simplified representation is a model. It has a reduced number of variables. We think about the possible relations between those variables. I'm going to illustrate the basic concept of a model on the basis of this. Now, as you can see, it's not uh, a translation. But, but it could be a translation. It's, it's uh, a mysterious box wrapped up in anonymous brown paper with an input and an output. You might like to think this is the source text going in or the translator's pay or the client's brief or the working conditions, anything you like. All the input there and the output there could be the translation or the translator satisfaction or anything else you like. Okay? And this mysterious space here about which we know nothing could be the translator's brain, the process by which we get from the input to the output, or in a behaviorist terminology, from stimulus to response. I, I, I don't want to stay at the level of stimulus response, but I am interested in this way of thinking about reality. Why? It simplifies things in terms of the variables, and it recognizes that there is a part of reality, the mysterious brown paper box, that we have to discover things about. That is, not everything is visible to our eye or to our senses. We're going to use research, use discovery procedures to find out things we don't already know. How are we going to find out? Well, you can compare all the mysterious brown boxes in the world, but to tell you the truth, there are not many like this. Or we can do experiments. And uh, today I'm going to do some simple experiments with this particular brown paper box. And you're going to draw a picture of what's inside. We could draw a picture now, but you haven't got much evidence to go on. Here we have a glass of water. It might represent a source text or anything else. We're going to put some water into the machine and see what comes out. Are you ready? Here we go. You see the glass is almost full. We've just put a bit of water in and nothing happens. We've now put a bit more water in. About half a glass has gone and water comes out. Let's see how much water comes out. Fair enough. 
We put in half a glass of water. We can now measure how much water has come out. Uh, let's just try this. I should uh, mention that I've stolen this machine from our chemistry department where it's used to illustrate scientific methodology. As you can see, we put in half a glass of water and we got out a full glass of water. This machine can be used to fertilize the deserts of Australia and the Sahara. It's a water machine, ladies and gentlemen. It produces more water than you put in, as you can see. And on the basis of that, we might ask you to draw a picture of what mystery is inside this machine. How can we produce more water than we put in? Would you like to draw that? Wait a minute, though. Wait, you're saying, this can't be true. And I suspect it's not entirely true. Let's try some more experiments. What can we do? Well, the only thing we can do is repeat the same experiment. Let me see. Let me put in a full glass of water. There we go. A full glass of water. And nothing comes out. Hmm. What else can we do? Let's put in half a glass of water. And now we get a full glass of water. It seems, ladies and gentlemen, that we have a mysterious machine that produces more water sometimes and less water in other times. Now, I invite you to stop this tape, stop this video, get out a piece of paper and draw what you think is inside. I'm serious. This is the creative part of scientific work. You don't know what's inside. You might have an idea. We've done some basic experiments. And now you can sit down and think about what could be there. And on the basis of that, we would do more experiments. So I'm going to wait here for about five minutes while you draw what's inside there. No, that's you. I mean, turn the video off. Don't just hang around. I'm not going to show you what's inside. Turn the video off. Do the drawing. Keep drawing. If you haven't finished drawing yet, I know you're not drawing. Please draw. I want to see your models. Okay, welcome back. Now you have your drawings in front of you. Um, some of you guessed correctly um, that inside here there is a, a, one of those long uh, Japanese pipes, you see, where you, you, you have the water in and then it reaches a certain point and then the equilibrium switches and it changes and so the water comes out. No. Um, other people have said that there's a little system of brushes inside uh, which come around so that when you get to a certain point the water is moved upwards and then it, it comes up. No, no. I can't make much sense of that. Other people said it, it's the same system you use when you're stealing petrol or gasoline from somebody else's car but if you've ever done that or if you've emptied the swimming pool you know that to do it, you have to, you have to suck the air out here to get it going. And I didn't have to suck the air out, did I? Hmm. Other people doubt that it's true, but I, we, we didn't measure the output, but I mean, it's the same. You'll see, it should be one and a half. One and a half, or a bit more. We might have actually gained some water along the way. I don't care what your answer was. I don't care what the right answer is. For most of the interesting problems in science, not just in the humanities, it, it's not a question of having a right or a wrong model. The model that you use here, whatever drawing you've got, will give you an idea upon which you can do other kinds of experiments. Put in lots more water or lots less water. Or try to build 
a simplified box like that until you get one that does the same thing. And then, will you know if it's exactly the same? No. But you will have a firmer grasp, a firmer approximation to the unknown complexity. Um, if you're lucky in some fields, you can get a big knife and cut open the box. But in the case of the translating brain, that is still rather difficult to do. In order to proceed beyond simple observation, you need that model, and the creation of the model is not automatic. It's not just observing. A lot of it means worrying, experimenting, using a lot of intuition, being very creative. Doing science is a very creative process, especially at the point of modeling a complex or unknown reality. Uh, any scientist could tell you that. I think translating is also a similarly creative process. It's not a stimulus uh, reaction or response uh, process at all. Anyone who does research, though, should also tell you that uh, the basic moment of modeling uh, is one of the most enjoyable aspects. Uh, you have a problem. How do these things relate? And often the solution, tentative solution, the model, will come to you at a moment of relative inspiration. And this does happen. It's one of the things that researchers live for. Well, like teachers uh, live for the student that actually progresses. Uh, or performers live for the applause of the audience. Research is often based on getting the idea that really explains how these particular variables relate. I'm producing a model. My final point, and I, I disagree with uh, some methodolog methodologists, I disagree with Andrew Chesterman on this point, I don't think that a model is the same as a hypothesis. A model is, is a picture that relates elements and possible relations, like your drawing of what's in here. It could be called an interpretative hypothesis, but I don't think that's true. Hypotheses can be right or wrong. Models can simply allow further research. Models in themselves are often equally valid. We could have two or three machines which operate differently inside and yet produce the same outcome. In the humanities, that is very, very possible. It's also Quine's uh, principle of indeterminacy in translation. However, I won't go into that here. Um, I, I do want to stress, though, that the process of producing a model is creative and not quite the same as the discipline of producing hypotheses. And our next talk will be about hypotheses. <laughs>